Soon. Yeah, in just about a minute. Okay. I'll get her going. Yeah, yeah. 
people just are meaning because of the character and or I'm extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> no, other people told me they were coming, we're not here. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Switch. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Dinner. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. 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 Second session is Sarah Schmidt is going to be telling us about the assassin survey and uh, players. Okay, I think I just turned it on. Did I? Yes. Okay, okay. great. So um, I feel like almost as much of a black sheep as the solar people um, because this is an entirely different sort of data that we're working with, essentially. And so today I'm going to talk about finding the largest flares on ultra cool dwarfs with assassin. So assassin is the acronym for the All Sky Automated Survey for Supernovae. Um, it's done through a big collaboration that's uh, primarily headed at Ohio State University where I did my previous postdoc. Um, the bigger names are my direct collaborators on this kind of stuff, but all the people listed are assassin people, and I'm sure it's incomplete in some way, and these are um, some cool star people I pulled in to get me data. Um, so the point of assassin is to discover nearby bright supernovae. Um, and they've been, been doing really well at this. Uh, one of the most recent supernovae is the most luminous ever found, and here's an artist's conception that I thought was really cool. But more importantly, how can we apply that to flares? So to talk a little bit about Assassin, it is an all-sky survey run out of two telescopes, and these are quad 14 centimeter telescopes located in the north and the south. And um, I like to put these pictures up to, because to me they look kind of like binoculars, but they're, they're really super powerful because of the way they observe the sky. So Assassin acquired first data in 2013, and since then they've been kind of ramping up, and over the past year, this is their sky, sky coverage. So it's currently all sky, and the colors here represent different numbers of nights in the past year, running from the pink, which is very few, up to that blue, which is 400 nights in the past year, so multiple observations. Um, on average, though, this is one observation every two days, so it's all sky every two days, which is pretty great. The observations, though, are three 100-second V-band images, and so that's not a lot when you're talking about flares. For supernovae, you get this image, and then you come back in a couple days later, and it's still very bright. Flares, not so much. Um, the magnitude range is about V of 9 down to 17, and that 17 is actually a co-add of those three 100-second images. So we can probe flares in that magnitude range. So um, how do we find flares in Assassin? Well, the main approach we've taken so far is that the data are examined daily, and this is to find the supernovae and the other transient events. What they do is they find and classify large events by image subtraction, essentially usually nothing in one image, in the reference image, and then the next day they take a subtraction and there's some sort of bright thing there. And this is actually an image of a flare that we um, found and classified in 2013. In 2012? No, 2013. Um, and remarkable events are actually posted online. So if you go to the Assassin website, 
there's a list of everything they found that they might think is interesting. So you can go through that if, if you feel like it. Um, that's one of the things I'm doing now. So we've talked a lot today so far, and I think we'll talk more in the future about really detailed and important work characterizing flares, figuring out where they come from, how they arise, looking at these things in detail. When you're talking about three data points, what can you hope to learn about flares? Well, you can get a total flare energy. I'll take you through this a little bit later, but you can at least estimate it. You can estimate the physical conditions. And now, I don't mean detailed physical conditions. I mean, I'm going to talk about extreme sorts of, of events. And so even getting something very rough is more than nothing for these sorts of events. And then hopefully, with the survey ongoing, we'll get a handle on the flare frequency. So how do we go about, oh, so during this talk, I'm going to talk, I'm going to use examples from the two flares we've classified so far. Um, this is a delta V equals nine magnitude flare on an MA dwarf, which um, we published a couple years ago. And something we observed in, a fe in February, which is an 11 magnitude flare on an L0 dwarf. It's currently submitted to FJ letters, and I've been waiting two weeks for the referee report. If you're refereeing it, please uh, get, that, get that back to us. Um, and I'm not going to talk about these in huge detail because I wanted to focus more on methods, but I have a poster downstairs that does take you through them. So, when we get the subtracted image to get that there's been some sort of, a, of an event, how do we classify it? Well, first thing we do is we take it to survey photometry. You look for a quiescent counterpoint, counterpart. We don't have quiescent images necessarily because we're looking at faint objects. You take that to photometric relations. So I've listed two citations, but really there are maybe even hundreds to try and classify from photometry what you think your object is. This is a star. You can start to get a rough spectral type, rough distant, distance, and a quiescent magnitude. And then you know kind of what sort of magnitude flare you're looking at. And at this point, sometimes we'll put out an ATAL. Um, these are more useful for longer lasting transient events, but for th these sorts of flares, it's just sort of a hey community, we've seen something interesting. Next, what we do is take optical and near-infrared spectroscopy. And when you com compare that to templates and standards, again, two references among many, you can start to get a spectral type, an idea of the quiescent activity, does it have H alpha emission or not, and if you're lucky and your data is good, radial velocity, even constraints on the age and metallicity. And here is the M8 dwarf that we saw the 9 magnitude flare on. And it is just very simply an M8 dwarf. It doesn't show any signs of which if it was a very young object accreting or something, we would see this in the optical and infrared spectra. And it doesn't show any signs of low metallicity. So it's, it's a very normal object. Then we take what we know about this object, and then we turn to the flare. And we start to look at the light curve. And this is a few points, but we actually imply an, apply an empirical light curve model. Um, the current one we're using is from Jim, Dav Jim Davenport's Kepler work to estimate a total V-band flare energy. Now, how well can we do this? I'm going to, I hopefully will convince you that we can do it okay. So this is the 11 magnitude flare on the l dwarf, And I'm showing it in terms of V-band flux. Now, I am holding in a factor of the distance to this object. Um, and the distance is a photometric distance, so it's good to 10% at best. Um, so you can keep that in mind. But I'm showing three points in flux, and then I have an inset, so I can look like I have six points, but it's really a zoom in so we can see a little better. Um, so to get a minimum flare energy, you might just integrate across these points. Great, connect the dots. That gives you 10 to 33 ergs. Considering this is an L0 dwarf, it's, you know, uh, 10 to the negative 5 times the luminosity of the sun. This is, this is a giant flare. But we know that flares don't look like that at all. Once something's that hot, it's not going to cool suddenly, giving you no emission after that first initial point. So this is where the empirical flare model comes from. <coughs> we think that all flares must have some sort of rise and decay phase. And so if you just assume that the peak emission is the peak of the flare model, you get five times that 10 to the 33 ergs in the V-band. And we even do go one step further, though the ground gets shakier the more steps you walk in this process, um, and minimize the distance between the flare model and the data. Now, I can't call this a fit because it is three parameters and three points, but the data are consistent with this model. And 
essentially what I want to show is that this 8, um, this 8 times 33, 8 times 10 to the 33 Eric Flair model, it essentially is this inflection point between the impulsive phase and the gradual phase, which is because this point is slightly lower than the others. If you don't buy that, it's fine. What this might be is an upper limit on the flare energy if it is a classic flare. You don't expect these three steep points to be in the quiescent decay phase. So 8, to the 10 8 times 10 to the 33 herbs in the end. So flare energy. What we can't put a limit on is if this is not a classical flare. We know that some large flares have more complex structures. We've talked a little bit about that already. I'm sure we'll hear more. If this flare had some sort of um, uh, sympathetic flaring going on, a larger structure than a single event, it could be a higher energy, and we wouldn't know that at all. So after we've tried to put a total V-band flare energy on there, next I take a look at the peak brightness to try to get even a rough handle on the physical conditions. And for that, I refer to the detailed energetics work a lot like the stuff we've talked about already today. Um, and use that to look at a range of flare temperatures and filling factors. So what I mean by this is I take the simplest assumption, I look at if this peak brightness is correct, um, then how much thermal emission do we need to, to have to reproduce it? And based on um, the works I'm referring here, I think that about 95% of the emission during impulsive phase should be thermal. It should be from a black body. If I take that brightness and I look at a range of temperatures that are consistent with um, flares we've observed before, then I get this pattern. So on the x-axis is temperature of that black body emission. On the y-axis is flare filling factor. And on the other y-axis is total area. The um, Error bars on these points incorporate the uncertainties in distance and in radius, which radius I assume what is reasonable for an L0 dwarf. I don't have a measurement. But the main takeaway I want to give you here is that for a 10,000 degree flare, which is a reasonable temperature for a flare this big, it's going to cover something like 30% of the surface. In total area, this is very similar to the strongest mid end dwarf flares. But in terms of area of the, of the star, it's really quite large. And I use it as an excuse to show this promotional image of a giant X-ray flare based on work done by Rachel Austin, um, which essentially shows the, a lot of the surface of the star being covered with this flare. So that's what I like to think about with these flares from Assassin. Oh, you're taking the picture. <laughs> so this is the recipe that I've used so far to um, sort of get to the physics of flares and Assassin. And I want to talk just for the last couple minutes about what I want to do in the future. So, and that's go towards assassin flare frequency. In addition to these two, and these two are the strongest flares we've detected in assassin, there are 25 other flares that basically have notifications. That means by hand, someone pulled them out. They're bigger than maybe about four or five magnitudes. And they said, oh, this is probably an M-dwarf. So with my collaborators, we're going to try and get follow up spectroscopy of those. Um, and then from the other perspective, I'm taking about 5,000 well-classified ultra-cool dwarfs from my SDSS work. We're feeding them into Assassin, which is an all-sky survey, and trying to get the, the photometry out to search for smaller flares. We've done some of this so far, and it's tough going. Um, and I kind of want to show you what this data looks like. So this is time. We've got V magnitude and delta V. This red line down here is, is an estimate of the quiescent magnitude of this object. And these lines, these arrows here, are all upper limits. Um, so assassin doesn't detect down with the quiescent magnitude. So we're looking for two-point excursions or three-point excursions where we think there may be flares. This one I haven't fully vetted yet, but it's the best candidate we have in our initial search of about 100 objects. The goal, and I think we've seen this plot reversed a couple times, is to get a handle on flare frequency, how often we get flares of a certain energy. <coughs> so this is work from Eric Hilton's thesis, um, active end dwarfs come in these three lines. This is work by uh, John Jesus and collaborators on the 1L1 dwarf in uh, Kepler. 
And I think that Assassin has the potential to fill in this space. So very large flares that occur infrequently. If we can leverage the all sky coverage, look at flares on a sample of objects, and just uh, plug for a poster on more of this L1 dwarf. And um, I wanted to conclude, conclude with getting meaningful information from the sparse data is only possible when we can rely on detailed previous observations. So if we want to leverage current and upcoming surveys, we need to do more of this detailed flare work to understand what we're looking at. That's all. Thanks. We have time for one short question. Wow, I think you get to tell. Yeah. Yeah, Sarah, is this the biggest flare of this type that's been seen? I mean, it looks like it's a little bigger than those players that John Giesa saw in the old board. It's It should be about 100 times bigger than those. Yeah. And the Kepler flares were actually the first flares with white light emission that had been detected. A lot of um, Elmore flares have just been sort of excursions in H alpha emission, nothing else. So it's, it's kind of unprobed territory in a lot of ways. Thank you. Okay, our next talk uh, in the afternoon session is going to be by Subhijit uh, Kamkar, who's going to talk about flares in a really interesting binary system. Uh, this is a contributed talk, so he has uh, six minutes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Subhijit Kamkar. I work with uh, Dr. Jesse Pande in Arivat Research Institute of Observational Sciences, ARIS. Uh, and today I will discuss the two super flares which was detected with uh, SWIFT Observatory on active binary CC Eridani. And the first flare was detected on uh, 2008 and another is in 2012. So, uh, CC Eidani is a binary, active binary with K7.5 V5, um, that means main sequence, and M3 spectroscopic binary, and it is uh, at, at the distance 11.51 parsec with rotational uh, velocity 1.56 days, and it is observed with 14 to 150 kV uh, energy band with back. Uh, Bosch color telescope and a 0.3 to 10 with X, uh, X ray telescope. And data reduction is done with standard packages available in F2s. Now, this is the light curve of the flare. Here, this is uh, uh, this portion is zoomed here. This is the 2008 flare and this is the 2012 flare. This uh, upper panel is the back. Um, light curve and this is the XRT light curve. Uh, so the blue line is the trigger um, time and since bat has large field of view, so the rise, rise phase is also detected uh, with the bat, uh, but after that the slew of the telescope takes some time and the XRT began its observation after 140 seconds. Uh, here also it XRT begins its observation after few times. Then this is the post flare state, uh, phase. Now we have done the uh, time dissolved spectroscopy and we have uh, take segment, um, uh, 11 segment for XRT, 9 segment for uh, back and we have chosen the segment in such a way that the total count in each segment become uh, almost equal. Uh, and these are the uh, X-ray uh, spectra, and this is the post flare spectra, and this is the uh, different uh, the spectra of different segment of layer one, and this is the spectra of different segment of layer two. And now uh, we have um, now we have uh, taken. Uh, Two temperature. Uh, we have fitted three temperature plasma since corona of the star is not in local thermodynamic equilibrium. So uh, 
there are multiple temperature presents. We uh, uh, previously, uh, uh, Chris Chapman 2007 and Pandey et al. 2008 has uh, found that quotient corona of this CC Aigani is uh, best fitted with two temperature plasma model. And we have taken those two temperature as the frozen background and taken the third temperature, this one, and varied it in different segments. Now here, this is the for player one. This is for player two. Now uh, we uh, to model to get the loop length of the player. We model the player with uh, the uh, we model the player with hydrodynamic loop modeling of uh, Rally uh, 2007. Here you see that the when this is the coronal loop. And when the reconnection happens at the yeah, when the reconnection happens at the loop top, the temperature increases first. After that, uh, the temperature heat pulse goes along the loop, and the soft X ray generates, and that gives the um, uh, luminosity in uh, peak. <coughs> After that, the when the heat pulse uh, hits this chromospheric cool point, the total uh, the density and the abundances of the element within the loop increases and we get the abundance peak. We, our player also followed that. Now with the, in case of solar and scalar players, we, uh, this is a, a known fact that the density temperature diagram gives, the slope of the density temperature diagram gives the uh, diagnostic of the heating and we got the heating and calculate, calculated the player loop length uh, for player 1 it is 1.25 into 10 to the power 10 centimeter, for player 2 it is 1.26 into 10 to the power 10 centimeter. Now uh, the other loop parameters derived from this loop length is uh, here is shown. Now um, what I want to emphasize is the total energy is uh, of the order of 10 to the power 35 R and the magnetic field is um, order of the order of kilogauss. The point is uh, at the surface of the star, uh, it is uh, the kilogauss order magnetic field is uh, possible, but it, the, this is uh, um, at this height of the coronal level, this much of magnetic field is very rare. It is. It was uh, previously found uh, with uh, um, Pavata 2000 for in, for a very large player of Inilac, and they suggested that the Dynamo, existing dynamo theory is not capable to uh, discuss this, so the dynamo theory needed to be modified. <coughs> and another thing, we have uh, find out the location of the flare in the stellar disk. Now, for that, we have uh, used the 6.4 kV iron phi alpha line, and for solar flare by um, by 1979, and for stellar flare Drake et al. 2008 has derived this formula where the flux above 7.11 kV, actually 7.11 kV is the uh, energy which is required, which is the threshold energy required to uh, e uh, eject the um, K shell uh, iron, uh, electron of the iron and in the fluorescence efficiency which here it is dependent of player height which we got from our loop modeling of hydrodynamic loop modeling and this is the observed K alpha flux. From here, our point of interest is the <coughs> F theta. Theta is the astrocentric angle. Actually, if this is the observer and this is the star, then this is the theta is zero. Astrocentric angle is zero. And from the limb, astrocentric angle is 90 degrees. So we modeled with this. And we got the loop height is around 0.1 stellar radii. Uh, because there are this is binary, and there are two components for M types, if we consider M type star, then the flare height is uh, uh, 0.14 stellar radii, for K, K type star it is 0 0.09 stellar radii, so almost 0 0.1 stellar radii. So this is the line uh, for 0 0.1 stellar radii using this model and we get that this is the portion where the model and the observed value overlap and from that we derive the asocentric angle of the flare is 88 degree. That means the flare is happening at the limb, not the uh, not the um, center of the star. 
and so this is the summary that uh, we got two detected two players where first player is three uh, goes up to 3.42 million kelvin second player goes up to 190 million kelvin the size of the player player in loop is almost equal 1.25 to 10 to the power 10 centimeter magnetic field is very high and that uh, shows that they, maybe there is need to modify the di present dynamo model because at this height this uh, magnetic field is very much rare and the flare is found to be located near the limb so um, yeah now uh, i um, expect your questions <laughs> thank you speaker come up while we set up we have time for maybe a very short question while we change the projector uh, you didn't say it. What's, what's the radius of the size of the loop and stellar radii? Yeah, it is 0.1 stellar radii. Uh, the radius for K, K type star, it is 0 0.76 uh, stellar, uh, 0.76 so, uh, solar radius is the um, radii of the. Give me it and this is solar radii or something. You're using centimeters on the one hand and you're selling the solar radii. So, what's that size of the stellar radii? Okay, for in terms of stellar radii, it is 0 0.1 stellar radii. 0 0.1. Okay. 0 0.1. Actually, there are two, it is binary, there are two components. One is M type. According to M type, it is 0 0.14 stellar radii. According to K, um, K type, it is 0 0.09 stellar radii. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Vijay. Thank you. Our next talk is also a contributed talk by uh, John Fine. There is. We're doing good. All right, he will tell us more about extra observations of players pending a projector. Okay, so I should have taken Suzanne's advice and tried the uh, connector before. survey catalog and the movers red star sdss catalog and uh, cross correlated them the aim is to use an extensive and uniform survey of dm star uh, x-ray flares complementing it and extending the earlier spectral type tyco xmm survey that we published last year i want to emphasize that the results presented here are rather preliminary uh, so we've got about 400,000 sources in XMM and about 9 million from the PSNIT out movers red star catalog and the main aim of the survey is to 
investigate the serendipitously observed X XMM, X-ray sources, because in some senses that's an unbiased flare sample. So we have about 2,000 matches from these large catalogues, of which around 200 stars have X-ray light curves in the standard data products, which we can investigate for flares, and from that, so far, we've got 31 flares from 24 stars, including one target star. Here's half a dozen example flares. The details are not important, but you can see the time scale. Each red bar is 10 kiloseconds, so the flares are between a few thousand seconds and a few tens of thousands of seconds. Uh, those ranges are largely set by the uh, sensitivity of the data and the time span of the observations. You can see that we have a variety of profiles from simple flares to possible overlapping ones, and at least a couple of cases where we've got two clear separate flares within one observation time frame. Plotting those in terms of distance and X-ray emitted energy, uh, the red spot is the one target XMM observation that fell within the survey. This is LP412-31, published a number of years ago by Beata Stelzer et al. Uh, the other serendipitously observed objects in blue are between about 70 and 300 parsecs in distance and have emitted X-ray energies from about 10 to the 32 ergs up to a few times 10 to the 34. If we look at that in the context of the previously published Tycho, earlier spectral type survey, Tycho clearly covers a somewhat wider <coughs> dynamic range, but the redder stars fall within the general envelope. Looking at the cumulative frequency distribution of flares, uh, the red box represents our preliminary results. The, the vertical dimensions represent uh, a current estimate of the error bars and the horizontal extent, the uh, minimum and maximum energies that we're plotting here of a few times 10 to the 33 to a few times 10 to the 34 ergs in terms of volumetric luminosities. Comparing that with our previous Tycho survey, that's shown in blue, and now with a few other previously published surveys from other authors. Uh, the black box is the Hawley et al. Kepler DM star survey. The purple line is EUVE G-type stars from Adar et al. 2000. The green line from Mehara et al. G-type Kepler stars. Reducing our Tycho numbers according to a scaling by quiescent X-ray luminosity brings it down to that level. And I think finally, those are just extrapolations of various published solar uh, results. And I do emphasize that at this stage, we haven't made any coverage or completeness corrections to our numbers, so it's rather preliminary. Um, I'll leave you with the summary um, future ideas. Thank you. Okay. How do you get the distance? Is that from the apparent magnitude? Yeah, using the formula uh, that was published uh, in about 2011, I think. So how come they're so far away? Sorry? Why are they so far away? That surprises me. Is it because you're looking at small areas of sky, basically? Well, it's... Because if you're the, looking at all sky, I would have thought you'd find a bazillion and they'd be close. Yeah, I think that might just be a volume effect, because although XMM covers the whole sky, it's only got 2% sky coverage. And you do see the one targeted object that's nearby, yeah, but then I think it's just the numbers game. It's just how few flares you ended up finding. Yeah, yes. 
I mean, that's partly a, an observational bias in terms of the size that you can uh, see. Basically, Jeff Rodin asked, how did you convert from the X-ray luminosity to the volumetric polarity? Okay, I just took a uh, fairly generic number from the literature of about a factor of three to four, but on a lot of scale. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, John. Uh, 
uh, light curves in calcium line from loops and from ribbons. So this is our main uh, way of uh, observation of flares, and this flare observation is a part of this FMR project. And now these observations are used to for simulate are compared to simulation. So uh, another part of the FMR project is is the modeling of solar chromospheric flares. There are many outstanding problems which uh, which appear, which are now, for example, how is the uh, how is uh, if we can model the, the evolution of solar flares, uh, what is the heating mechanism of flaring plasma, and uh, what is the emission mechanism of this, for example, and what is also the mechanism of white light emission, which was today mentioned by uh, by Martinez, and there are many other questions which we try to to analyze. Uh, of course, spectroscopic data are the main source of information about the physical parameters of plasma in flares and not only in flares. And these spectroscopic data, high resolution, high dispersion spectra, are used to, uh, to compare with the synthetic spectra obtained from models. And in this way, we can deduce, uh, we can analyze what is the physical, what are the phys what is the physical state of, of plasma and what is what are the physical processes. So some examples of analysis, this is the white light flare uh, problem which we are now working on. This is a, one example from HMI, you can see in some moment you can see some brightening at upstairs and this is the difference images, image or movie. And this flare was also observed by optical spectra and you can see very nice, uh, very nice uh, white light emission of this flare. Another example of work, of theoretical, theoretical work uh, or comparison of data with, with modeling is this uh, modeling of the flare uh, above the sunspot penumbra. Uh, apparently it appears that uh, the flare uh, above sunspots can be modeled by two component model. One is low lying chromospheric ribbons and another is uh, some kind of cloud model of, of, hot, of, uh, of cool loops, cool dense loops. And also there are many examples uh, of, of uh, Modelings uh, which are done uh, within this FMR project, for example, here are some time evolution of of uh, flare of model of flare and also the corresponding Barnard continuum. All these papers are uh, in the website of FROMA. So now let's come back at the end to this FROMA. So as I mentioned, uh, there are four main uh, so four main uh, points of this project. First is to collect the new flare data or to find uh, the previous flare data which can be used for, for the investigation. Then uh, some groups uh, developed uh, new models and or improved uh, existing uh, modeling codes uh, which are, are now used for, for flare modeling. And of course the main results uh, come after the model data comparison. We compare the model with data and we get um, as I mentioned, I, as I told, we now we can deduce some parameters of flaring plasma. Uh, one of the important uh, output of this model is the, uh, the catalog of an archive of flares. This catalog uh, is already done. There are more than 100, uh, 400 flares which are put at the website, the address. You can visit them. These flares, uh, all these flares uh, uh, have some ground-based data because uh, our project as Roma is based uh, also, or the, import, the important part of the data are ground-based data, ground-based spectroscopic data. So all these flares, all these 470 flares, uh, have some ground-based uh, observation. Some of these flares, uh, in, for some of these flares, we can we have also uh, a full set of data which you can download and ana analyze uh, using specific software. <coughs> and. Uh, finally, one of the uh, one of the purpose of the Ekroma project is, of course, dissemination of the results of our studies uh, to solar physics and also non-professional community. But also, the idea is to involve uh, amateur astronomers uh, in observation of solar flares and in data analysis. This is uh, this work package WP8. Uh, this is important uh, work package of this project. So why do we want to involve amateur astronomers to, for flare observation? Because there are many of amateur astronomers and flares uh, appear suddenly. There are short, uh, short, they have short time scale. So ground-based professional instruments or satellites can uh, may miss uh, flares. But because amateurs are, because there are many amateurs uh, which are scatter, who are scattered through the world, the probability of observation of flares by them is, is quite high. Of course, they have not such uh, 
big telescopes, but it is also some advantage because sometimes uh, our big uh, devices has uh, some small field of view and they are already pointed at some point uh, to, to, to some target, but the flare can appear in different places, so it's, it's sometimes it takes a lot of time or it's even impossible to change, to change the pointing for flare. So that's why, because the amateurs have uh, smaller tel telescopes with larger field of view and they can quickly change the orientation, they may catch the flare. And also, uh, it, was, it was mentioned by Pet Peter Heinzel that we now we come back to this uh, mm. low dispersion data and white, white light observation, and amateurs can help us to observe uh, flares in white light because uh, professional instruments has only this narrow band uh, public color of meters, which are very complicated, and uh, we cannot have broadband spectra. So that's why we organized uh, we organized already one F Hunter campaign. It was organized last year in September. Uh, all the details concerning the participation of non-professionals in solar flare observation are included in the another website, no, uh, some part of website of Efroma. The address is above. This is a website dedicated to, to amateur astronomers. They can find many information about uh, about flares in this website. They can find also manuals, how to observe the sun, uh, what to, 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 to which uh, the, attention should, the, the biggest attention should be paid, and also some information about F-Hunters. So the second F-Hunters campaign will be this July, uh, from 13th to 21st. This, the dates are determined in the way that we have, we, get, we got some time, for, some training time in, in big ground-based facilities. In this, in this case, it is Gregor Telescope and also IMIS, probably and also a Swedish, uh, Swedish telescope. So we combined, we, we decided about these dates to have coverage from professional instruments and, and also from amateurs. Uh, so in this, this is another screenshot from this website. You see some guides, safety guides, uh, introduction to solar photography, tutorial, this DSLR, and so on. When you click, you can read uh, in details how to observe or what to do. And during the campaign, every day we send for amateurs such a observing sheet. It's a target uh, where, where we point to what, what is the, the target for the day in order that amateurs can easily find the, the point. The problem is now that, for example, now sun has no sunspot at all. Okay. It was at least one day ago. I don't know how it's now, but it's very weak activity now. So this is the announcement. Uh, ah no, this is some preliminary result. Just at the end to show some preliminary results of this first F hundred campaigns. Here you have two days with this uh, X-ray, soft X-ray curves from Gauss. Uh, each such increases some flare, and with these color lines, you see the the moments or the times of observation by amateur astronomers. So you see that for some days it's quite quite uh, many, quite many observation, but. Uh, Unfortunately, for example, these two big flares, um, M-class flares, were not sketched by amateurs also. But we have some preliminary observations. You see that the quality of data obtained from amateurs are, is quite high sometimes. Uh, but of course, it's, it's mainly imaging. It's not a spectroscopic data. That's why we, we, uh, we asked them to, to prepare long time series, because long time series of calibrated images is also very important, because, for example, if we know that the transmission of filter, we can compute the integrated intensity, for example, of HSR alpha line. And this integrated intensity is, it is some kind of matrix which can be compared with theoretical models. So this can be used for determining some of, of, no, for, for determining of, of plasma parameters and flare models. So finally, the, the banner of F Hunters 2. So please remember this date, and also we have a page on in Facebook, in Twitter, and uh, and you can visit these two websites to to know more about this project. So thank you for your attention. Time for a question. Adam. So it's really neat uh, involving the amateurs um, with the. You know, small solar telescopes. How realistic would it be to use put a U-band, Johnson U-band, 
filter on one of those telescopes so we can directly compare the broadband. Yes, it, it can be done. We, 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 I think we put some information about it in our website, but if not, I will check it out with you because it could be quite useful, yes, to compare, for example, this data with another data from the stars, yes? You, you mean this, yes? Yes, yes, yes. it is, it is a good idea. But because some amateurs have, not many, but some amateurs have such sets of features because it is popular, yes. And I wanted to ask if uh, you had any hope of getting worldwide coverage to have continuous monitoring of the sun, even though you wouldn't be absorbing at the same yes, time. Yes, yes, at the same time, we'll be observing in this big Gregor telescope and also in telescope and also space support, support from space data, you uh, know, it's with and Of course, there are some, solar, some space telescopes which observe the full disk, so it's not a problem, then we have it. So, yes, it would be. The idea is to have observation from as many instruments as possible to have multi wavelengths and multi band spectroscopy. Right, so watching at home, telescopes, put them up the sun. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, if someone has telescopy. Yeah. Right, thank you. Thank you. All right, time for our penultimate talk. Vittoria is going to tell us about multi wavelength views of magnetic activity here. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, Mike is good. Okay, good. Screen works. Okay, so I got more players for you. Six minutes. Yeah. yeah. More players for you. Good players from premium sequence stars this time. Uh, and not in one band, not in two bands, but in three bands. <laughs> so, um, so why premium sequence stars? We know we are. We are very active in X-rays and, and, and have got big players. This has an impact also on the superstellar uh, material, the disks, uh, the, the activity, X-ray emission, UV emission can uh, eat and unite the disks uh, and drive uh, evolution in a significant way. And players, of course, uh, can have their, their role as well. Uh, we know a lot about X-rays. Uh, they are much brighter than the sun of magnitude. They can be long. They can come from long loops. Uh, even the stellar idea is maybe even connecting the star with the inner disk, but that's debated. In the optical, we don't know a lot, we don't know almost anything, I think, uh, uh, and I don't think there's any simultaneous optical X-ray observations, and also nothing in the mid infrared that we'll see why that is relevant. Uh, so the data will come from this coordinated synoptic investigation like the C2N264, and the C2N264 in a star, it's a star forming region of about 3 million years. Uh, this is a uh, nice uh, project carried out in uh, late 2011, so it's pretty old. Uh, ma the main, uh, I don't have the time to, for the details, the, the main thing is that we have uh, data in uh, for all, with for all in the optical band, with Spitzer in the medium infrared, with Chandra in, in the soft X rays. Uh, I'll discuss uh, simultaneous observations during the Chandra observation, we suppose also to post uh, in a few seconds. Um, so that's. Uh, here on the left, you have an X-ray image, and a, on, the, on the right, a Spitzer image of the star forming regions. Uh, don't have time for details of, about the observations. Um, let's get to the, the flames. Uh, so here's a typical example. Well, not really typical, but anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so on the top, you have a coral light curve, a small piece of a coral light curve with a nice flame. On the bottom, you have the same coral uh, light curve. Uh, subtracted by non pairing uh, emission this time, which is both rather flat in this case, and an X ray uh, light curve, which is the black dots with arrow bars. Uh, we are not here discussing details about the uh, shape of the light curves. I'm trying to get a, a feature, a general feature of the energetics of these layers. Uh, so, what I'll do is just measure uh, or estimate better the, the energy, the full energy emitted in the different bands and the big luminosity and see how these things correlate with each other. Uh, we have a couple more examples. Here's another one here. Uh, a fair one here, here you see in the top panel, you get four O, uh, optical light curve. In the second panel, you have a 3.6 micron light curve. Uh, and the two bottom panels are the same as, as above, but subtracted by the moment of flooding emission uh, and with X-ray uh, light curve suffering post. A uh, fair example, uh, we got for all again, uh, 4.5 4, 4. micron uh, light curve, and, and again, the two uh, continuum subtracted uh, light curve. This shows that uh, there are many cases in which it, I mean, defining the flare 
is not obvious. For example, you look at the coral light curve. I, I've chosen that continuum, but you, can, you could have cho chosen another one, you know, making the uh, energy, say, uncertain uh, by a factor of two or so. So you might wonder, I would, I would love to show you more examples, but there's no time for that. Uh, given there are some uncertainties, these are some, some of the worst ones, but those actually were the best ones. <laughs> uh, correlations, we do find some, but uh, pretty good ones actually. Uh, so you got here on the left, uh, optical energy versus that soft X-ray energy. This optical energy is actually, uh, it's a volumetric uh, energy uh, which I think I estimate assuming a black body uh, spectrum at 10 to the 4 Kelvin. Uh, you see, there is a, a pretty good correlation between the two. Uh, scattering is actually rather small, <laughs> see don't, all the uncertainties uh, involved in estimates. Uh, uh, and you see, I get flares up to 10 to the 37 amps, uh, huge flares. And uh, I'm plotting with different colors, class two and class three stars, class without distance, and class with distance, not, not, not distance here, uh, in these plots. Uh, and on the left hand uh, right hand side, you see uh, peak luminosities, uh, units of 10 to 32 x per second in that case. Uh, and again, you see a pretty good correlation considering all the uncertainties. Uh, now let's uh, turn to uh, the, the medium parameter this time, two minutes. <laughs> Uh, and here you see, we also have, this, have the same thing with uh, on the y-axis, you have medium for quantities. Again, these are quantities, uh, are volumetric luminosities uh, and energies assuming the same spectrum as uh, before, uh, estimated from the pixel data. Uh, you see there's a correlation, especially if you look at the class 2 stars, and the interesting thing, there's also a task one point there, uh, and the interesting thing is that uh, the uh, class, the stars with this have much higher infrared luminosity, uh, much brighter flares than class three stars, and that's significant. Uh, if you actually look at the um, ratio, this is the ratio between infrared and optical quantities, energies and peak luminosities versus X-ray uh, quantities. Uh, um, you see the difference is pretty, is quite significant. I mean the the red points. Uh, are, are uh, you know, stuck with this have much brighter uh, infrared emission. Uh, now these ratios, uh, as I said, are, are, should be the same. The, the, the two quantities which I take the ratio of should be the same numbers uh, because they are. If I, if I assume the, the, the spectrum correctly at 10 to the 4 uh, Kelvin black body, the ratio should be one because these are uh, you know these are volumetric energies. Assume that spectrum. Uh, they're not one. That means uh, the spectrum is not that. Uh, the one I assumed, uh, if, you if you look only at the uh, class 3 star, and look at the in this uh, peak velocity box, uh, the green points are, are um, almost the same, uh, have almost the same ratio, and this can be turned into, uh, if you assume black body emission, this can be turned into a, a temperature. And the temperatures have to be between 7 and 8,000 Kelvin in that case. So it's quite reasonable to assume that you have optical and infrared emission from the peak of the loop. Uh, and in, instead, the, the, the infrared emission, that's in class three stars, but in class two stars instead, uh, you have this assault, this large excess, uh, which is reasonable, reasonable to think that comes from the reprocessing of, of, of the uh, optical and X-ray emission from the loop, from the of the loop, uh, uh, by the stream stellar disk, which is in the colder and emits a that wavelength. So we are seeing the right, uh, you know, uh, impact of flares on the stream stellar disk. Uh, that's, yeah, that's, uh, so that's our conclusion. We have to see a lot of players that would have some more conclusions, but <laughs> that's as much as I can do now. Uh, so we see the energy, we can know the X-ray data is highly correlated. Of course, there's a lot more in the optical than in X-rays, that's known generally. Uh, and we have a strong anti-correct excess for players in time to come That's it. So we have time for maybe one question while uh, Suzanne will make the sound. So for the class two sources, do you see a delay uh, in the IR relative to the optical? Uh, or is it yeah, no, I mean, that's hard to see. I mean, the delay you would expect, I mean, if the flight time between the star and this would be less than a minute. Uh, so we, we, we look for it, uh, we don't see. I mean, it's, it's, the data are not 
is good. Yeah, I'm not thinking of just light travel time, but just the what well, is the thermalize. Uh, no, no, we don't. We don't actually. The uh, I checked. Uh, I mean, the optical and the infrared players are you know, about, are about about the same time. Uh, they, they, they come before, of course, before the X-ray players. You know, most, most often you see the you know the the, the impulse the optical and infrared. Uh, so, I think the thermalization is is just uh, takes no time at all. And these grains are not small, but just. Needs little introduction. Uh, Suzanne Holly will talk about flares, predictions from LSST. Thanks. Um, it's really gratifying to see all the people here that are interested in flares, many of them my students and collaborators. <coughs> um, so today I'm going to talk about the, um, uh, the NOAO LSST workshop on US OIR follow up capabilities. So LSST is supposed to start taking data in 2022. So it's rapidly approaching. Um, and so there was this uh, workshop that was commissioned to look at what kind of follow-up capabilities were needed. And uh, I was uh, picked to head the STARS study group. And so um, we concentrated on magnetic activity in STARS. So we talked about rotation and flares and uh, open clusters and so forth. But um, I'm just going to talk about the flares part of it today. And these are the members of the group. Almost everyone is here. Um, so just for some of you who maybe aren't uh, familiar with what LSST is going to do, it's an 8 meter telescope, it's going to survey the entire southern sky up to about, and it's not totally decided, but around the declination of 5 or 10 degrees, um, approximately once every three days. Um, most of the data is actually going to be taken in the rudder filters, uh, R-I-Z-Y, but there will be some data taken in U and G. Um, the precision is claimed to be about a hundredth of a magnitude <coughs> or less um, for a magnitude range. Uh, the bright limit is 16, uh, the faint limit is about 26, um, but the precision isn't as good in the very faintest uh, magnitude bins. And the data, this is kind of important, that the data are obtained as two consecutive 15 second exposures. Um, they're combined into one data point when they're put in the, into the main catalogs, <coughs> but the individual exposures will be available and so if for example you thought that you saw a flare um, you could go back and look at the two exposures and see if it showed up in both of them uh, and that would be um, a way to validate your your uh, uh, flare finding so here's an issue um, this is gj1243 it's an active m4 star in the kepler field <coughs> This is three days of GJ1243, so you can see the star spot variation. You can also see it has lots of flares. Um, and if uh, LSST is only sampling this light curve once every three days, uh, then the flares are only going to be single point outliers. And probably the only one that you would see would be that one around day 542. Um, because the other, the other uh, smaller flares that you see there, you wouldn't be able to necessarily find compared to the star spot variation. Um, and so one important point is that after LSST has been observing for uh, some time, a year or two, um, you'll be able to map out the light curves of the stars. And then once you have the light curve, then you'll be able to look at much smaller excursions from the light curve. But in the initial data, you'll only be able to look for larger excursions. So we ran some simulations to see how many flares we would be able to um, uh, predict and that we would see from uh, from uh, LSST using the current cadence model. So we used the trilegal uh, simulations, um, looked at five different latitudes from minus 10 to minus 80. Uh, the model data that you get from trilegal um, includes the age, the temperature, the distance, and the magnitudes for every star. So on the left here, we see the number of stars per square degree um, at different latitudes. So at um, 
low galactic latitude, which is at the top, the red one, B equals minus 10, you have lots of stars, and at high galactic latitude, much less stars. And over here in the, um, uh, you see this number of stars per square degree at different spectral types. So the G stars, there's not as many, but they're brighter. The K stars, there's more. Um, and the M stars, there's lots, but they're a lot fainter. Uh, so those are the galactic models that we start out with. And then the next thing is to simulate the flares. Um, and so Jim Davenport was, re was uh, responsible for these flare simulations. So he um, used his uh, canonical flare shape from the Kepler data uh, and then produced these one-year light curves <coughs> um, using different flare frequency distributions. And so those look like, uh, as we've seen several times today, these are the number of flares at a given energy uh, versus energy. And so we have um, data for active M dwarfs, inactive M dwarfs, the very most active super flare G stars, and then the sun, and then that's a relatively inactive K star. We have some active K stars. And so we have a range of um, uh, flare frequency distributions that we assign to the stars based on their ages and their temperatures. Um, and so then we have basically six different uh, levels of flare frequency from the very most active, which would be on the youngest G stars, um, but, but could last into the, a, a little bit older in the M stars. And then all the way down to the red curve, maybe you can see that there's only one flare right there in that entire year for the very most inactive stars. Um, so then to do the simulations, uh, you gener generate a light curve for every star in the test field, um, and then sample um, those light curves with the LSST cadence. Um, and then flares are identified as 0.1 magnitude, which would be about a 10 sigma excursion uh, from the median magnitude of the light curve. And then find the number of uh, flares that are recovered at each latitude and which stars they occur on. So um, in the upper left here, you can see that uh, for those different, those same five uh, latitude, uh, galactic latitude bins, um, uh, you can see that obviously if there's more stars, you're going to recover more flares. Um, the interesting thing in that is that almost all the flares are recovered for G-band uh, magnitudes less than 24. Um, here, if we just add, sort of integrate under those, this is in the full 10-year survey. If you integrate under the under those curves um, and get the full number of flares that you see, um, from the highest latitudes, you see about 100 flares per square degree. Um, and the lowest latitudes, uh, you see about uh, 10,000 scars per square degree. And at the lowest latitudes, it's interesting that you can see flares all the way out to 10 kiloparsecs. Um, so we're really sampling different uh, populations of flare, of flare stars um, with these data. So LSST is going to be a great window on flares throughout the galaxy. Um, it turns out that 97% of the stars with recovered flares are M dwarfs, um, and that's mostly because the G and K field stars are usually too old, and so their activity has gone away. Um, and also, the contrast effect, uh, relatively few of them will, be, will have big enough flares to show a 0.1 magnitude excursion. So if we can lower that limit to just a few hundreds of a magnitude, um, then we'll probably see more flares on the G and K stars. Um, it was interesting that very few stars were undetected in quiescence and were seen only when flaring. Almost all the stars had uh, the quiescent magnitude less than 24. Um, so that's interesting, um, for example, for looking at the ultra cool dwarfs. Now, we didn't try to, um, to model the, the brown dwarfs yet. And uh, the G dwarf super flares, uh, we looked at in particular. It turns out they likely occur only a few times a year in a typical LSST field, and then you would have to be looking at it exactly at the time they occur, so they're going to be relatively rare. Um, but if they were seen, we would be able to bring the full force of the LSST follow-up, uh, the alert pipelines, uh, and the transient uh, pipelines that they're um, producing for all their, you know, GRBs and quasars and etc. Uh, supernovae, um, all of that could be brought to bear on immediately following up uh, these G-dwarf superflares so that we could actually get, you know, time result spectroscopy perhaps, which would be a, a great thing. Um, so our full report is going to be available soon. It's about 25 pages or so. Uh, and we also simulated rotation, activity cycles, open clusters, all of those same things in open clusters. Um, and the report will be posted at this, at this website. Uh, thanks.
Quilly, I think that's great work. Um, we have time, time for a question. So if you see a super flare on a G dwarf, how do you know what you're seeing? In other words, how do you know it's a G dwarf? Now, these are faint stars, we don't know a darn thing about them. This one's color? Yeah, they'd be. Um, what we have been talking about in the report is that we probably wouldn't try to follow up a G dwarf like in the first year, but after three or four years where we actually have light curves, we've already seen the spot pattern on the star, we have the colors, we've done follow-up spectroscopy, um, then we would know that that star was a good candidate. And all of that will be in the database already and will be identified when the transient goes off. Um, so that's all part of the kind of alert pipeline. So you're uh, presuming that stars are the pink themselves. No. Uh, so we're just saying that we're going to map all. Uh, we're going to photomet photometrically map all the stars in the galaxy that we can see down to a magnitude of 26, um, below a declination of 10 or 5 degrees, and so then we'll have all this uh, data in the database about what those stars are, and then so then if we see a small excursion, we'll be able to say, okay, let's go do it. All right. Let's give a round of applause for all of our speakers and thank you. So we're running just a couple minutes behind schedule. We're planning to have a roundtable discussion, which I hope you all stick around and we can uh, bat around some of the ideas discussed. We're going to take about five minutes to uh, put some things away, and then we'll start the roundtable discussion.